session, 5.30, January 21st. Um, and we've got one topic on equity tonight. And um, the first thing, well, this is the conversation I think we wanted to have. We talked about kind of our goals for this meeting at the board meeting, and, and Sean and I chatted with Steve and agenda setting and, and what we're trying to accomplish. I think we, we just approved the, plan. <coughs> hey, JP, we just started. Um, we approved the, sorry, the comprehensive, the comprehensive equity, diversity, and inclusion plan at our last meeting, and it's very wide ranging and fantastic in terms of the goals that are outlined in there. But as we've all said, we can't move the needle on everything in there all at the same time, so we need to prioritize. And so um, I think one of the things that we want to talk a bit about tonight with um, our directors and, and Matt and Chase are, you know, what are we doing in the district around some of the things that are covered in the equity plan? What are some themes and trends and, and activities you're seeing, you know, in our schools or in our community that you think might point to some additional work that we might want to do from a prioritized standpoint? And should we, you know, can we talk about what some of those things might look like? And then um, the final thing we're going to do is just to make sure that the board, we're, we're good on what our role is through all of this. Um, because we want to be supportive, we want to, you know, um, provide the, the guidance and the direction, but we certainly don't want to get down to the micromanaging, you know, parts of all of this. So, so this is, I think, a conversation on the recruitment plan. What do we have underway? What are some themes and trends that we're seeing happening in our schools and community that we might want to think about some reprioritization from a, and how we want to address the matters. And that's, I think, maybe where we want to start. Others, Lina, Sean, Charlie, to add into what we're trying to accomplish tonight. It's just, it's to help prioritize the work in the, in the equity plan as we're on the front, based on what we're seeing in our schools. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, there's been, you know, a handful of specific incidents that have been brought to board members' attention specifically, but, you know, plenty of other things that are, you know, brought to the attention of the administration long before we hear about it. Um, and I think that's fine in most cases, right? I think we've talked about, you know, where is it appropriate or not appropriate to let the board know? Where do you put that line? Which is almost a possible thing to decide on where that line should be. Um, but I think um, even as, as Charlie mentioned at the board table last week, right, it's not, let's cast blame on past things, but how do we move forward, right? And that's yeah. how our plan's gonna help us do that. So I think it's more kind of broad strokes, like what things can we help with as a board, or, or what kind of direction can we provide, and what things are being done, you know, from the administration level to kind of just systematically address things as opposed to just the one-off type of things. Well, and that's the, that's the other thing from a board member's standpoint, we do get these, we, we have these flashes. Something happens and, you know, there's a lot of attention, there's a lot of dialogue, a lot of discussion, and people come to us and we're at meetings and we hear these things. But without kind of that broader context of what's happening every day and the themes and the trends, I don't want to overreact <coughs> on this one, uh, one incident when that could be a, a one-off and, and it's been addressed and there's not a concern that's going to repeat. There may be other things that I'm less aware of that might should be driving prioritized work. So that's kind of what I'm looking forward to. I don't want to overreact to a good one incident and it's isolated. I want, to, I want to address the more systemic things that we actually think we can make progress on. And I, I don't want to overreact, but I think sometimes we, we have to react. And sometimes if we don't know anything, like how do we react? Mm -hmm. And you know, I think, you know, if we say things like, trust us, that's never received very well. Like, oh no, we, we got this, we know what we're doing. Even if we might feel like we're on a good path, which that's how I feel, like, you know, we're on a good path, but we're just starting <coughs> that path, but people are coming with, like, it's about time, when are you gonna fix this? I'm not being listened to, my kids aren't being listened to, um, this is just more of the same, and, I, and it's hard to know how to respond to yeah. that, when, when we may not even know what they're talking about. Well, I like what you said about responding, because I think that's what this conversation gives us a chance to do, and not that reacting is necessarily always bad, but instead of a quick reaction or an overreaction, I think the conversation allows us to make sure we're delivering thoughtful in our response, right, and that we have a well-thought-out plan, and uh, Janet mentioned about uh, being able to come back to the equity plan and where, where some of those things fit, and I think the reason we have the goals we have in the equity plan are because some of the themes and trends we either internally have seen or even our stakeholder groups outside have, have said hey these are things that are recurring right and these are things that continue to go on and we continue to hear about 
And so one incident may be more public and catch more attention than another, but I think the goals are stated in the plan because of data points we have from community members or things like our student climate experience survey data that shows us, hey, these things must be happening on some level, right, if kids are reporting this type of an experience in our environment. And so, like I said, I, I don't think we want to minimize those, those big experiences, those big flashes, but we also need, need to stay rooted in some of the work and the direction you guys provide to us about where our focus efforts need to be, right? And I think that's what this conversation allows us to do. Um, when I think about probably the reason we're having this conversation, it's really around that goal three, right? About how do we create equitable, inclusive, and supportive school environments? Um, because if we're hitting that out of the park and doing a good job with that, um, some of these other things hopefully occur less or never occur, right? And that we never have those experiences for our kids in school. Of course, we still deal with adolescents, right? We know they're not going to probably be perfect, um, but we want to have a, a safe environment where where students aren't going to school and experiencing that type of, of treatment or uh, seeing that from their peers. And so, to me, to answer your question in kind of a, a generalized way, it's really, I mean, those are the themes and trends we're seeing. I mean, and those are what's written in the goals, right? We see structurally uh, disadvantaged students achieving at less rates because we think there's an opportunity gap that leads to that achievement gap. We see disparate discipline. Uh, we've talked a lot about that one. Uh, but I really think some of that disparate discipline also comes from goal three, right, around how do we have supportive and inclusive environments where maybe we head off those discipline events from ever occurring or uh, some of the instances we run into. So, yeah. um, and then the fifth goal, I think, is an important one, too, that talks about stakeholder engagement with parents, students, and community members as well about, um, you know, how are we communicating back and forth as a school community uh, to some of our important stakeholder groups and to our parents um, that the experience they may be, may be coming home and, and talking about may not be what we perceive as the experience, right? And if there's a disconnect there, then we need to try to understand that disconnect and improve it and improve their experience there. So those would be a couple of my initial thoughts. Um, you know, from a report out structure, I think what we had planned with the equity plan was to kind of go goal by goal and share with you, you know, some of the work underway um, in some greater detail. That's what we had shared with that equity plan. Um, maybe from this conversation tonight, you give us uh, some idea about which goal we should start with. Uh, we had talk, talked about taking it chronologically, one, two, three, but if there's some chance to respond to a, a current situation, maybe that's starting with goal three and coming back with, okay, what's the current work underway? What is this, you know, situation or situations um, allow us to maybe move on a little bit sooner in that regard? And I can talk through, you know, a couple of those pieces loosely if that would be helpful tonight. But that would be my suggestion is, okay, well, which of these do we think has the greatest urgency and which one would you like to hear more about first? And then if we don't think we're going far enough when we do our report out, that's a conversation we can have too. I, I think goal three is super important. You know, it feels to me that if we can address some of the things around um, student mental and emotional well-being and reducing bullying and harassment and inclusion, some of those things I feel like we start moving the needle on the disproportionality potentially mm -hmm. and also even get into the opportunity gap. If kids are not engaging in learning because they're upset or worried or, you know, other things are happening at school that they aren't feeling included or they're feeling, you know, having negative experiences, it's going to get in the way of them learning. And right. I would say it's like a Maslow's hierarchy of needs thing, right? I mean, if we yeah. can't do those foundational pieces, how do we ever get to some of those more significant yeah. learning pieces, right? If those yeah. needs aren't being met. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, I would, for me, two and three kind of go hand in hand. Exactly. So mm -hmm. that, I mean, because we know, and based on those numbers that we get, that we're seeing that dis proportionality and discipline and how does that tie to creating an equitable inclusive environment so I would like if possible potentially be focused there and I Janet mentioned and I'll just say that to me the way we would reduce the disproportionality and create those environments is through our culturally responsive policies so I mean I guess it's you know I mean that's you know, how do we reduce disproportionality? We're going to have different practice, different policy, and 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 that's and I you know and however we go through this, and I think I think as we go through this plan and we deal with it in a very um, tangible way, where where you guys are saying here's how we're implementing it, 
you know, I think we're going to see that's going to give us, I know, from somebody who looked through this and helped develop this, I think that's where the rubber hits the road and you start to recognize, you know, maybe some of these goals are more like one goal. Instead, it's hard to separate them, right? It, it yeah. is hard to separate them. They all interact. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, if we're hearing this down here at the, you know, students contact us or parents contact us or we're hearing just rumors of things out in the media, and then we as a board have set sort of a policy that's, that we as a board are like, you know, here's as a district what we believe, uh, these are our values, and I guess I'm just interested in how does that work for all of the people who have to do the work because people will tell us, well, if here's how the board is, that's not my experience in school, so what's wrong? Mm -hmm. And that's where it's like, okay, um, I don't know what's wrong. I'll have to. And that's why I like 3E in particular. I remember the conversation around that when we worked on the plan, JP, because it really talked about, you know, identifying the role all the way down to the student level, right? I mean, what's the, the board level, the district admin team level, the building level? Uh, admin team level, the teachers in the classroom, and then the students, you know, and trying to think about, you know, that word accountability throughout the structure to say, if this is what we believe, then how are we seeing it, you know, on all of those levels, and what's the commitment to all of those, but I like how you started tying them together too, right, because it's hard to talk about, you know, creating an equitable, inclusive, and supportive school environment without teachers that are culturally proficient, or yeah. administrative staff that's not culturally proficient, and so all of those are linked together in some way, shape, or form, that's why it'll be hard when we do talk about a goal at a time. To, yeah, to just talk about that one. We'll really be talking in other areas too because the work complements and even some of the action steps that we're working on, you'll see in multiple areas, right? Mm -hmm. Because the it overlaps. So um, I think just an, another probably context piece is, you know, we were involved in that implicit bias training for a three year period with all of our staff. Um, this year, um, outside of the LGBTQ work that's continued, uh, that was identified through some of that UI policy center work we really work to make sure we had a, a solid new equity plan and that'll be our work is, is kind of tabulating the work that's together and continuing some of the pieces that are in place. Um, but moving forward, I think what we've started to identify too is uh, really culturally, um, uh, I don't want to, cultural competency, I guess is, is the word, or proficiency, you know, whatever <coughs> phrase you want to attach to it. Um, that's the work we think needs to have for teachers, but then also students. And so how do you drill it down to the student level a little bit too? Um, and I think that's the area where you'll probably see us come back and talk to you some more about is that's where we really see probably the next professional learning for staff and students is around that culturally proficient uh, piece or competent piece. Mm -hmm. You know, people get hung up sometimes. That's why I'm switching between the words on exactly what that means. And we'll have some definitions that come back from the equity advisory committee around some of these terms that help us all have a common understanding too. But we really see that as probably the intentional race layer of this conversation uh, that needs to happen because there's a lot of things in the equity plan that cover a lot of different parts but I think in particular we're here tonight because of somewhat of a race issue and our equity plan obviously has to address and account for that in a very intentional way and I would see that as some of that work as well. I'm pretty much okay with the direction I think you're suggesting we should take. Um, I am apprehensive about things like promoting, uh, having goals, things that are worded as promoting um, uh, <coughs> developing, supporting, those are goal, goal words. <coughs> the number of kids that get sent to an office, the number of kids who are proficient, those are definitely measurable things. Um, <coughs> so in terms of putting the whole plan together, I'm thinking that I'm going to be looking for measurable things that may come from your, you know, or there may be a, a agreement among board members that we're going to get at those measurable things do, by doing things that sound to me a little sort of squishy, maybe. Okay. Right, and I think part of what you'll see is, I think that's a really good point, Charlie, because those all sound great in theory, you yeah. know, but you don't want it just to be uh, speak or just talk, right? And so how do we get down yeah. into that? And so one of the things you guys saw in the public facing part of the document we released already is the baseline measures or the outcome measures. So where are we right. starting and then what would we like to see? What would we like to see those outcome measures change? And how do we increase outcome? What'll come back as we break down these goals are actual metrics, 
right? Okay. And so right. the metric should be the data points we look at to say, right. are we seeing movement? Have we seen movement on, um, you know, fewer failing grades? You know, if we talk about an opportunity gap question, what have we seen in course enrollment data, you know, that would show us we're closing opportunity right. gaps? Yeah. Right. In particular, the discipline, you mentioned a couple things around office referrals or, yeah. um, you know, suspension data. You know, some of those things we have <coughs> probably more readily. Um, ones like create an equitable, inclusive, and supportive school environment, I think those metrics would be a little bit more interesting breakdown, right? What are the things we're looking for okay. in that end? And I think that's part of what our team is also working on is to say, how do we identify those measures so if we know that we're moving or that we're okay. just staying stagnant? Okay. And I agree with that. What, what I hope doesn't happen is we say we want to reduce suspensions, and all that happens is people just stop getting suspended mm -hmm. without yeah 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 just yeah. Yeah. Cause, yeah. You, you know because I know we can you can do that I mean you can play with data any way you want <clears> to <throat> get at the hard number we're asking for and so I, not to not have them we need those metrics but I also I guess the squishy part that I want to know is especially leadership do they believe it? are they bought in to the, this concept do they understand um, if we just talk about race right now, do they understand that it, it's an issue? That, that, that however you want to define it, this racism is a systemic problem, and if we're the system, we're part of the problem. And that we're, we can, we don't have staff saying, well, it's not me. I'm not a race, you know, because that was a point of the implicit bias training. And I know that wasn't perfect, and, and there were lots of um, issues with it being, you know, it's hard to provide quality 10 hour professional development experience for our staff when we're breaking it up over chunks. Um, but I guess that's the point of saying, hey, now everybody's trained in a plus by so, so at least we're, and I get, you know, we've got all of our staff, which is a lot of people, but especially if we're building leadership, our principals and our assistant principals, you know, those are the people that we can more easily say, this is the lens that we view this through. And if you don't accept the lens, I find it hard that people are gonna do, do the work with a genuine gut level, like, wow, there's something wrong here and I have to fix it, rather than a defensive, you know, I'm not the problem, they keep making all these things, we're gonna get a new board in a few years, and then, because in it, that's just a stereotype in education, that boards and policy makers come up with ideas and it's gonna be gone. Eventually, this too shall pass. No child left behind, eventually, it'll be gone. And we'll do what we need to do in the meantime, but and we'll still do fifty percent proficiency. Right? Yeah, it won't change the needle much. So I, that's the the part that I don't know that we can get a metric on. But where I sort of trust staff to say, you know, maybe so. You take our culture and climate survey data, and you see where the hot spots are, and then you guys are going in to say, hey, <coughs> Principal X, what's going on? Like, yeah. what, what, where, you know, because that's a little, it's harder to gauge. But there's some people who kind of get it, and then there's people who are like, not, not me, that's not my problem, I, I don't see <coughs> other, however that's phrased, I mean, I've heard it a lot of times of, I'm race neutral, I don't really think that way, and I think it's hard to move forward with this work if we don't have that sort of fundamental kind of gut level belief in, in the lens, and, and, it's, I, and I'm, I don't think it's just because this board was elected and we're doing this work, Everything I've seen, right, we're basing this all on some strong evidence and data that's out there. That's not, that's, that's some of us maybe if we've worked in the field or, or we've lived it, kind of know, you know, like when I would talk to some of my students about the way they were treated. Have you ever been followed in a grocery store? And they, or, you know, a store, and they look at me like, what a dumb question. Like, of course. Like why would, and it's just such a, a fundamental assumption, whereas some people are like, who don't have these experience, like, well that doesn't, no, that's not real, that doesn't happen in Iowa City. Mm -hmm. And one is based in experience and, and reality, and one is based in just an idea that doesn't have any basis. So, so rather than just being a board that happens to be equity driven and, and maybe politically motivated to do this work, it, it feels to me like it's founded in a lot deeper Deeper understandings, actual data, you know, lots of evidence out there that these things are an issue. And so do we have people who like believe it? Hey, this is a systemic problem. And if I'm part of the system, I'm part of the problem, which means 
I'm part of the solution. And that to me is the powerful part when people can say, okay, I recognize how I'm a part of the problem, and then it can be fixed. But if we have a lot of people saying, yeah, it's not my problem. I don't think that way. I don't, since I vote this way, I don't really have these beliefs. And I think, and I don't know, I guess that's what I'm asking you. I, I, sure. I, I mean, I think that. So I think to me that's a question of <clears throat> can administration uh, steal basically the set of principles we have <clears throat> to actually accomplish these goals that are expressed in the equity plan? Well, <laughs> yeah, um, I'm going to I'm going to go to J JP's first and then and then come back and then. We, we believe that, that the administration, uh, both from you know what we what we see, but then also what we've heard in their engagement, that they that they are committed to doing this work. They understand the importance, and they don't just understand the importance because it's coming from the board, but because they do believe it's the right thing to do for our students. And you're right that it's hard to show that metric, but one thing I think that we're trying to do to to do that is to have the administrators walk that walk in terms of training and being involved and it's not just a training that's done to the staff or to this part right having people engage in that and so that we're all learning together as part of that um, i think one of the challenges that comes in is then when there is an incident or something happens that um, you know people aren't happy with there sometimes can be an overreaction to well if that administrator cared more this wouldn't have happened, right? And, and that's not the reality. We, we, we know that in some of our schools that sometimes that, that, doesn't, that, that narrative doesn't match. And so it is how do we respond? What are the things we do? And I think that's where you see some of that care, JP, and some of the administration, how, how do they bounce back from some of that? Um, and then it is incumbent on Matt and Amy, me and Steve to go out and have those those difficult conversations with those administrators and, and start talking to them. And we do it in a variety of ways, whether it's a student incident, which would be maybe more Matt and Amy's side, or whether it's Nick and Jeremy, Jeremy and I pulling their staffing data and saying, hey, you've had 10 openings in the last three years and you haven't hired one diversity candidate. Right. Tell me about that. I mean, we, we have to be willing to, to, to have those conversations. and. Um, I, I think that is something that, that, that we're willing to do, and, but they're uncomfortable, right? And why, why are they uncomfortable? Well, you know... I, I, Charlie, I, I think as much as we're leaders and we're yeah. supervisors, nobody ever enjoys that conversation, right? And right. I think the thing where Chase says, it, it, obviously we all have to have those conversations, and that's what we're here to do, and that's part of the job being the leader, but when we say do they believe in it and things like that, I mean, I can tell you when those events happen or when public <coughs> fights happen in their buildings, the administrators are, they're wounded in a sense, right? Yes. I mean, they, yeah. they feel sick that those things happen in their building. They don't want those things occurring either. And I think like Chase said, it's more a matter of what do we see in the response, right? I mean, that's where I, okay, a negative event happened, how do we then come together as a school community and respond to it? Or do we just try to say, well, that happened, we're just gonna keep moving on. Right, I mean, that's where I think the tell is in, are they really committed and believing in the work? Um, I don't think it's a leadership team issue about if we believe in the work. I think it's Agreed. about how do we impact the system to get different results than we continually see. And that system is huge and it's hard to change. And I think that's where Chase says, you know, when we have to pull data and look at it like that or go back and say, you know, you might have needed to rethink how we handled the student situation or now let's talk about what we do to move forward. I mean, that's where our job is to help push their thinking. Their job is building principles is to help push their staff's thinking, right? And a lot of times principles end up dealing with the things brought to them, right? And so that's an interaction that's happened somewhere else in the building uh, between a staff member and a student or between a couple students. But they're responsible for the culture of that building. So right. what can they do to influence the system again? And so. We spend a lot of time on those system level conversations. Um, I think you know what everybody is hungry for are answers to those questions, right? And I think that's where we're trying to get to. I don't think it's a, we don't believe it's upon us. I mean, they see it every single day. And so it's, it's how do we impact and start to get different results? How do we get to start to have a positive school culture? How do we impact you know, 
I could take the math example of what we've worked on as a math team and, and wanting to have different achievement results for our kids and understanding and being committed to the fact that we need to do something different on the opportunity end if we're really going to see that, right? Knowing that if I want a different school environment, I'm going to have to probably do some outside the box things and look at some PBIS models in our high schools, right, that we haven't seen before. So I think having a risk to make those change, knowing all the while they're going to be on the front lines of also the pushback from privilege whenever we make any of those changes. From right? and parents. From mm -hmm. parents of privilege. Right. And so when they make those changes and step into those uncomfortable areas, that's where they also need support to know that they're being backed up. And, and honestly, I see that as our role as the mm -hmm. district team and as the board, right, is right. to know if we're serious about this change, not everybody's going to be happy about the change and think it's a great idea because it's all those unsaid things, you know, that are out there that we're up against sometimes. They won't say them out loud until oh, yeah. maybe the change starts to affect how their student receives the school experience and how some things start to look different. You guys live that with the boundary conversation, <laughs> right? Say, right? And this conversation is now is going to get real close to the student level on, on a multiple levels if we're serious about some mm -hmm. of the things outlined in this plan. So. When you ask where we need support from the board or where I think our building teams need support from the district administrative team is to continue to back them and support them as they make those changes and work through the concerns. Um, I can detail, I'll give one example and then I'll, I'll try to be quiet a little bit. But uh, we had a building principal want to make a change to uh, the release at the end of the school day about when the buses would pull out of the parking lot. Because oftentimes what happened is we'd have groups of students waiting, right? And not necessarily the students were doing anything wrong, but they would receive negative interactions potentially from adults. They would maybe get into some negative interactions with kids because it's unstructured time. Adolescence and unstructured time, not always a good recipe for success, right? So trying to reduce that, well, by doing that, it put a schedule tight on some orchestra students to get out from their orchestra class at the end of the day to get their instrument, to get to their locker, to get to the bus. Three or four parents about forced the change of this principle to go back to the other way, where all the while we were avoiding maybe a potential suspension, mm -hmm. negative interactions, you know, from adults to kids. And so that's one where we just had to support the principal and say, you're doing the right things for the right reasons. You're trying to keep your kids from getting into a situation that could potentially negative for them, whether it's with a peer or with a staff member. And so just because we have a couple parents upset that their kid's a little stressed on the time to get to the bus, we're not gonna change the whole system because those are two very vocal you know, individuals. So can those parents and the board get together and the parents hear from the board that this is a good idea, we're gonna do it? I'm not sure what you're asking. Sorry. Well, if it's, instead of the principal having to deal with the parents on their own, have the arrange for the board and the parents to get together and the parents can hear from the board that the principal had. In all honesty, the best idea. in all honesty, yeah. I, I think the idea of providing that support to the principal and if Matt or Steve or the principal comes to the board, yeah. that encouragement that they're doing the right thing, because I understand what you're saying, Charlie, but that's the exact opposite of what we want. Yeah. We don't want community members every time they're unhappy with the decision that the principal's <coughs> made going around the yeah. administrative team. Yeah. And coming to the board so be because better for, for the administra yeah, administration to the ability, the authority, and the, the intentions of the principal or the teacher or whoever. I mean, we, we have to support through policy prioritization. These kinds of meetings where we're very publicly saying this is what we believe. These are our values. These are the goals of the district, and we support everyone out in the building who is pushing these goals forward. We don't. I, we, don't, I, we wouldn't even entertain. Either those kinds of complaints. Now the flip well, side will come up during the comment. Oh so, yeah, that's and that's fine. fine yeah. But I, I think if we open that Pandora box, yeah. all of our work okay. would that, be okay. yeah. dealing with, with parents, parents yeah, that have an issue right. with okay. either yeah, the right. administration, yeah. our administration, right. teachers, right. because that's just it, it would be never ending. Yeah, that, that's I'm fine with knowing that a, the best way to handle that from the board level is for the board to be very clear that. For the administration, that we're uh, we're supporting you. Mm -hmm. So, and if, right, I, yeah, that'd be great. Okay. And, but if we make that ask, right, and that's where we tell the board that they would could be most supportive of us, then there's a level of communication incumbent on us. And I don't know if that's this conversation or a different yeah, conversation, <laughs> where if that's happening and we know that's bubbling, we need to give you a heads up, yeah. so you're not caught off guard. <clears throat> 
by parents coming to you and saying, hey, you're, we're making this dismissal, they're making this dismissal change and being all upset because then you don't have the backstory yeah, right. of, of why we're doing it, right. right? And so we put you in a bad spot. And so, yes, I think that's the best way to move forward in a team and the support for the building principal or teacher yeah. or for the admin. But then we need to do our part to make sure that we don't we just need to leave you flat footed. Because, yeah. because you guys can get into a constant loop of well, board. Right. And I don't think that's what we're asking for. I'm certainly not. Um, but there are certain, because how we respond, I think you were talking about that, Matt, how we, because stuff's going to happen. Mm -hmm. now, no matter how well intentioned we are, no matter how hard we work in our culture, things are going to happen that are going to be disappointing or you know, counter to our yeah. culture. And how we respond is as important as anything else. And then, so, so if an incident occurs, if we do know that it happened and here's how we're responding, then that helps us be able to cut through any misinformation or sort of the one-sided stories that always come up in these kinds of situations. And But it's finding the balance. And, and, and we're going to get some right, we're going to get some wrong, we're going to miss some, I mean, that's just how the nature of this yeah. stuff is. We think this is not going to become a big public thing and it might escalate. And so I, I, I don't want to burden you with over-communicating because I know that could become a, a full-time job. But, you know, and we also need to get know to be proactive, hey, I'm going to this meeting, um, are there any, is there anything going on I should know about? Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, we all have a calendar of the various committees and community groups that we attend. And maybe we just need to pay a little bit more close attention to what's happening on a, on a Monday night and going, well, okay, I'm going to give these guys a heads up who are walking into this meeting that this is bubbling. Yeah. Or we take the, the incentive to, or the proactives to call you guys up and say, hey, What's going on? I'm getting mm -hmm. ready to walk into this meeting. Is there anything I need to know? Any backstory context that would be helpful? Sure. I, I mean, I almost feel like it's easier for us to ask <coughs> the question um, because y'all are just so incredibly busy. And, and, and I mean, it could be a five minute phone conversation. You know what I mean? Um, well, I, I think and there it's are like some you, norms that have you know, gotten created that maybe aren't the best norms around that. Like you said, I mean, I do think there's some things, as Chase was talking about, we can easily pick the phone and say, hey, you know, one, you know this is out there, this is going on. Other things we might not catch, and you might get a community commenter that comes up and well, complains about something. All, and then yeah. I think what we would just say is just ask the question. Before we agenda it, you know, before we, you know, have a, a reaction to it, first ask the question, let us tell you at least what we've done. Yeah. And then if you're not happy with it, then let's talk about it further. Yeah. But I think that's the, that is a somewhat difficult situation for us sometimes when we know community commenters are standing up there and telling you guys half the story and it's like, can I get my three minutes? Yeah. You know? yeah. So I'd probably give you three or four minutes on that topic too, you know, but that doesn't always happen. But I think as long as we're okay with knowing we can continue to have the conversation around whatever that issue is, if it's something that you heard that was like, geez, this sounds a mess or this sounds a foul, you know, talk to us. But I do think, like Chase said, there's some things too that, you know, for us, I think it, it's a filter of saying, okay, you guys need to be aware of this one. Yeah, and just sort of level setting on when it crosses that threshold and then you just send a note out to the board. Well, and, it's, and again, email's not the greatest way to right. me either. So and it's always just that assuming positive intent that everybody's on the same page because <laughs> it's like predicting the weather. You never know when a storm is actually going to kick up or when it's going to pass by because I look at some of the things, and this is just in a general sense, that have popped up at a building, whether it's a personnel issue or something else, and we're like, okay, we think that one's gonna hit the news, and so we think it's gonna raise that level, so we better tell the board, and so we get all the details, and then, right, nothing ever happens. And then something else will happen, and we're like, oh, well, that's, that's not a big deal, there's no, right? So you just, you never know, and so it is sometimes hard to strike that balance because it might be a slow news week, or it might be a busy news yeah, week. Yeah. And so. I mean, I think actually for us, the easy thing for us to do is just to pick up the phone. Yeah. Maybe go to this meeting. Is there anything going on that I need to know before I walk into a public forum? If, mm -hmm. if nothing has sort of crossed that threshold for y'all feeling like you need to kind of proactively mm -hmm. let us know. But well, and one of the things that Matt and I talked about today, and sorry, Sean, I know I cut you off, but I don't want to forget, is that maybe something that we want to consider is that for some of those forums or some of those standing community groups that the board has <coughs> liaison on to, we match an administrative yeah. liaison and so yeah, that yeah. They, and so that we never leave the board out there by themselves. At the same time, we never leave the administration out there by themselves. Yeah. So if the administrator gets out there and they start talking, so well, I'm just going to go to the board, Charlie can step in and say, well, you see Chase and I are sitting next to each other, yeah, right? Yeah. So 
and I don't know if it could happen for all of them, but it might be a nice, it might be a nice way to again it shows collaboration and it shows how, how we're thinking. But yeah, I was just gonna say that that um, the importance of that communication uh, is true both directions and finding the line in both directions. And what I'm trying to get at is you know someone will contact me specifically and ask me to look into something. I feel like I'm a detective and I'm kind of going behind the scenes trying to find stuff <laughs> yeah. out. Because right? I don't want to throw anybody else on them. Like, there's reasons they maybe don't want their name out there. Yeah. They don't want, yeah, uh, right. you know, they don't want to be Absolutely. stirring the pot too much, right? They want somebody to just hear them and look into something. And there's been times when I hear something and I'll go and ask a principal or something like, tell me more about the story and I will not have told anybody in administration that it even happened. It's because I sort of make the assumption that people are aware of things, right? That's what I'm saying, it goes both ways. And I think it's fair for us to say, hey, I've heard that there's stuff going on in this area and I've been asked to look into it just without throwing people under the bus and giving names and things like that, just to let you know that maybe I am going to go to a school and, and witness something firsthand, because that's what we get asked to do, I think, every now and then. Like, hey, go, just go to the school and see what it's like there, kind of deal. Um, oh, yeah. But I, I think we owe it to you to say, hey, this has been brought up, and we're going to do something, whatever it might be. Well, I think one thing, and for whatever reason, <coughs> well, here's me in a lot of different you know, ways than a couple other districts I've worked in. But I think one thing I, I see more here, and it's probably, I mean, just a credit to you guys and how responsive you are and how connected you are to the community. Yeah, you know, here in Iowa City, maybe in comparison to other places, but is how many times people will call you instead of us as an administrative team, right? I think we see that as part of our job, is trying to keep those things away from you, right? But when they don't call us first and they, they call you, you know, we don't have a chance to problem solve it before it ends up in your lap. and so. You know, one thing that, you know, I would just ask, I mean, wherever you're comfortable to do it is say, hey, have you talked to Matt, Amy, or Chase about oh, this? Yeah. You know, would you feel comfortable calling them and seeing if, and then if you're not happy with the response, then call me back. You know, I think that would be a, a really helpful thing that would also start to keep you from seeing the influx of whatever you might see that we're not even aware of. But um, and I did I, do I really, that at least once. So. What? I, I have done that at least once. Because <laughs> <laughs> that is our job, right? We get paid to do this, right? I mean, you guys are here to volunteer in service, and you want to be responsive to your community, so I'm, I'm not trying to suggest not talking to them and not hearing from them, but if there's something that we're closer to the situation on some level, right, and, and can probably have a greater impact on directly changing the outcome for yeah. whatever they're unhappy right. about, then we'd like an opportunity to fix that where appropriate. And I, I gets back to your point of just we need to be able to deal. If we're hearing something, we shouldn't try to solve it. That's not our job. And send the people to you or just let you know this is bubbling and there's some concerns and so you can manage it. Yeah, I just feel like I can't ask you to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. I want you to tell me everything, but I'm not telling you anything, right? Like that's not yeah. <laughs> good operation, right? Yeah. So I mean, if we want to be more transparent about what's going on, or not even transparent, if we all want to be more informed so we can better react to things, then it behooves all of us to share yeah. when things happen that we think are yeah. going to impact. Uh, the one of the things that always comes up is people want us to go visit schools is because class size, this year specific, class sizes are big. Yeah. And everybody wants us to come see how bad it is, all right? We all know that, yeah. right? I think sometimes the parents just want us to be aware of it, and so we, we hear them. We're like, yep, yep, class sizes are bad, and we're really trying to make class sizes better, right? But I'm not going to be able to say, all right, we're going to hire somebody for a school Y in kindergarten. <laughs> like, I can't do that. So that's where it has to say, hey, we're being told that this particular area is a hot spot. But you guys hear that kind of stuff, too. We've got like 50 hot spots now. Um, but I think it's at least fair to say here's the, the chatter about town. It is weird. You're talking about our district is different. I think the sheer size of it covering all these different municipalities and we all are kind of owned by our own municipality, right? Pretty sure most of the people in North Liberty, if they have an issue, they're going to call me, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and I guess Corville folks might call JP. Iowa City folks got a choice, right? <laughs> they get to look around. But, um, we just have these... Yeah. Areas where people really feel more comfortable reaching out to us as individuals than the administration, and it 
I think it, you're right. I think we should say, hey, have you actually talked to anybody else about this? Or you came right to me. And I don't want that to come off as a bad thing at all, because no, I'm glad they do. I just think there's some situations where it's like, okay, we'd love a chance to try to help that person with their with their problem, right? And, and that yeah, I think the fair response on our yeah. side is, I can help you get in touch with the right people that are going to be able to yeah. work that situation. Or even, I mean, I don't know, I always approach it, I'm happy to listen, but I also want you to tell your story to Matt. I mean, if it's a secondary <laughs> issue or a building principle. I mean, I always try and redirect, but I kind of sometimes feel like I should at least listen. I'm not promising anything. I'll listen and then say mm -hmm. that, like, have you shared this with the people that actually can solve your problem? Right. Because that's an important organizational piece, I think, right? Because it's what our what we work with our principals trying to guarantee to the teachers that if somebody calls a principal, if they haven't mm -hmm. talked to the teacher, we yeah. ask them to talk to the teacher first. Yep. Same thing. If somebody calls to complain about a principal to me, I say, "Have you shared this with the principal?" You know, mm -hmm. or they had a chance to respond. So, Absolutely. I just think that's a, a healthy way we build trust with each other, right, throughout the organization. Mm -hmm. So. So going back to <clears throat> maybe JP's um, concern about whether or not the um, entire body of principles are, um, <clears throat> have bought into the equity plan approach, does I understand that you were pretty much thinking that most of them have? Yeah, I, I think if you had a comprehensive diversity, equity, inclusion plan of this size and scale, or even the one we just came from, or a strategic plan that you didn't have leaders bought in, they wouldn't continue to be here. I mean, that's that's part of the issue, and that's hard to say, but I mean, that is foundational to our work, and so they have to be bought into it. I like what JP said about the gut level. How does it bother you? You know, one of the first things we started with this year with our secondary MTSS work, multi-tier system of supports was this idea of collective efficacy, and we talked about that at one time, uh, Charlie, but is, you know, do you think you can impact the problem? Does this problem bother you, first of all? You know, I think yeah. we have consensus that it bothers people, right? Do you think For whatever that's a, reason, you're, you're confident of that? That, that it bothers is? them, yeah. I mean, they're, they don't like to continue to see, you know, the disparate results. I mean, especially for the amount of time and energy those people put into the system, right? I mean, yeah. they're working super hard, right? And they're here all hours, and they're they're really, you know, nose to the grindstone on doing it. So does it bother them? Sure. And then the second part of that is, though, do you believe you can make a difference, right? Do you believe you can start to see different results based on some of the things we're going to do, you know? And then once we're there, then it's about, okay, now what do I do to get those results, right? And I think that's the work we're involved in. So um, we're here because we want to change the system. You know, we want it to work for all. That's one of the first things we start with is, do you believe all kids can learn at high levels? Because all has to mean all. Mm -hmm. It has to mean everybody, yeah. okay? And so we start from that foundation, and then we go to, now do you believe you can get different results? Now I think that belief, the job of the building principal is to go do that same work with their staff. Yeah, and then and then to the goal 3E, to students, I mean, mm -hmm. to, to them too. Because right. students are saying, I don't, I'm not comfortable, this doesn't feel good, and then, I recognize the problem, what can I do? I mean, if you start getting that self-efficacy at the student level, right. that's powerful. And I feel like PBIS is a framework for kind of having those conversations and setting the values and, and reinforcing, I don't know. Yeah. I could well, that. I think improving, yeah, like you said there, their self-efficacy. And again, we could go back to some of the system work we're doing on one of the academic pieces about, you know, what do they believe about their identity in that subject area? Do they, does the student believe that, right? Because that's kind yeah. of the teacher's role is, taking that and molding that that image of the student that they can be successful in doing that. Yeah. So all the way down the system, we have to have that working. And that's probably why it's hard. But yeah. Charlie, the, the thing I would add to Matt, not to contradict Matt, is, but I think we would be remiss if we said that all of our principals are at the same level in their journey, right? Yeah. That all of our all of our principals, every, all of our leaders have different strengths in some, their strengths more align with this work that we started, so they're out in front. Are there others that um, are committed, they believe in the work, they know it's important, but need more coaching on how best to approach it with, your, with their staff? Yes, doesn't mean they don't believe in the work, doesn't mean they can't do it, it just means that they're not, they're not exactly where we need them to be to, to lead that work, and so we have to continue to, to coach and build that capacity of their leadership, because they've got a lot of, They've got a lot on their plates, and they might have strengths in another area that are really making their building go. 
So we need to give them the support in this area. And, and that's not unique to this piece of our strategic plan. We have built it, we have, you know, I can tell you the strengths of a bunch of our different leaders. And um, so I think that's the piece of it. Are they all committed? Do they believe in it? Do they believe it's important? Yes. Are they all at the same point in their developmental journey? No. I think that to JP's but, language of saying yeah. it's yeah. systematic problems and then to recognize, wait, I'm part of the system, yeah. right? Because yeah. it's really easy to say, yeah, there's problems in our system. Let's fix the system. And it's a whole different thing to say, how do I fix me so I'm a better part to the well, system? Yeah. Right? That's, that's a huge mindset change. And that's where everybody's so, journey is probably a little bit different. So I think that one way that one <clears throat> place that we've recognized that and that the principals have, have reached out to a newer resource here at the ESC is some of the work that Laura Gray is doing. Mm -hmm. You know, her former principal colleagues mm -hmm. know the role that she can play, know her strengths, and they invite her out to her building. And the feedback we get about the PD that Laura leads is tremendously positive and so that's that self-reflection piece right from some of our principals knowing this is important for <clears throat> you to do this I can't do this alone I'm gonna call somebody out to help me navigate some of these conversations and that's a strength of some of those folks they need to get to a point where they can do more of that on their own but to be able to reach out and bring some of those resources that we already have in the district talks to their self their self-reflection and their and they're continuing to build then yeah. the expectation becomes they need to transfer those skills absolutely right because right. laura right. comes out and is able to sit with them show some of the skills you know needed to effectively handle those situations and then just like anything just like a principal coach and a teacher a director working with the principal is the expectation is that those skills that are transferred and they're able to do that on their own frequently but chase is exactly right i mean that's a great example of where you know they know they're the variable right but where they might need some help because they're a little different point there continue with how it goes. And that, I mean, we would expect that. You know, as long as people have some sort of gut level belief in um, the problem, generally, globally speaking, and their uh, ability to affect it, they believe in their efficacy, and they understand the situation, and they have a growth mindset, and they're willing to take help, I mean, I think that's, that, if we have that, I mean, that's a lot. That's that, a lot. That, then we can go somewhere. I think. You know, the worry is you, you get those folks with a more of a fixed mindset or a more check-the-box mentality, a compliance-based mentality, um, you know, people who just, you know, it's the same kind of thing. If, if, if there's new educational information about how people learn and you don't accept that, and you're like, no, I've done it this way for 30 years, even though brain science tells us all sorts of things, those are the folks I think it's hard to see them maintaining in the system when and it's all about mindset, right? It's like if a teacher was struggling and they need to be on intensive assistance, the ones who make it are the ones who embrace that. And they say, okay, I know I need help. I know I need these weekly meetings. I want to make some changes and I'm open to it. And they end up doing well. And it's those other folks where it's just that really tough journey. And you sort of know all along because you're like, if you, <laughs> if you just take the help, yeah. like, please. We're here for you. We want to coach. We have some ideas. It's not my way or the highway. Just be open to change, um, and that's you know. And I and that and and the the, the easier part, but um, it's not easy. The difference between intensive assistance is it's in a negotiated agreement, and principals are at will. I know that's not that's not easy yeah. at all. Easy, probably even harder because you don't have a something to fall back on. But it does give the organization more flexibility to be able to to make some of those gut level and, and not gut level calls either to somebody. I mean, some of those where you kind of know that's going on and, and, and we're not seeing the movement. And you can make some of those. And sometimes, you know, right, that's an adjustment. It's not like you're not going to be in the organization. I mean, maybe it rises to that level. And maybe it's just like, well, you're in the wrong spot here. And maybe there's a better spot for you somewhere else then. And I think there's a couple things when I make that comment. I mean, not only would it be a difficult relationship to continue from a supervisor to a supervisee employee, but this would not be the right place for you to work. You would not enjoy your job. Based on the amount of things we talk about and the work we lead, this would not be the environment you'd want to be in. I mean, and that's the hard part to probably relay to our community or even to you guys sometimes is how many of our conversations do revolve around this stuff. Because 
you know, we could stand up and talk to her blue in the face, but when we don't see it results, sometimes that's also hard to probably think, you know, that we're either being honest or as transparent as we could about that. But I mean, every meeting we have, every conversation we have goes back to the, is rooted in those things. And so when I stood up and presented that plan to you and said, if it's not on this list, it's hard to us imagine us doing it. I mean, I'm being honest from an yeah. academic end, you know, in that regard. So it just would not be a comfortable place to be because you'd be leading or trying to lead a bunch of work you're not believing in or committed to. I mean, it would not be a good experience for you on that level, so. So do you guys have a sense of, I mean, I know it's a big work, or you've been doing it a long time. I guess, we, you know, we have the list, we have six goals, so where do you see the biggest impact? Maybe as an organization, I mean, as a board, you can say, hey, this is where we need your help. But where, you know, where do you think we could have the most movement of those six goals? Where do you think we could have the, the biggest impact? Or which? You. The organization. Yeah, which you of those? On the organization as a whole. The organization the yeah, yeah. So the if you think about, like, okay, here's our big, um, uh, not the easiest thing to tackle, but the part where we focus our time and energy and we can see the most shift? Is it like hiring? Is it? Chase is thinking kind of, of this kind of, kind of hiring plan. We need bit. some resources yeah. to do that. Yeah. I, but, I've been looking at, I've been trying to look at most things in my life now, not even just school stuff, but at work and everything else through this sort of MTSS framework, right? Finding the things that are good for everybody, right? And I look at our goals and I see, I like, you know, I like three, four, and six, right? The creating the culturally responsive uh, policies and practices and the hiring of diverse staff and creating the environment, like that's good for everybody, right? And that one is very specific on reducing, you know, our achievement gaps, right? And then reducing disproportionality and discipline. And number two, those are very specific things that I think if you start doing stuff that's good for everybody, the other stuff takes less intensive effort because you're already putting groundwork yeah. things in place. And you know, we talk about you know, from a uh, principal or teacher's perspective, you know, what can I do? I'm trying to look at these like, what can I do as the board member, right? And those are the things I can directly affect is helping craft, you know, what sorts of policies and practices we want. And, what type of school environment we are going to create, and that's how we are going to help, and hopefully the rest of it falls in line, right? I don't think you ignore the rest of it, because if you still think of it in the MTSS picture, right, there's still that tip of the pyramid. It's not like you just lop it off and forget about it, but I think if you do those big picture things that are good for everybody, it makes those other pieces because easier to accomplish. And so that's where I would, think the bigger bang for the buck is stuff that yeah. is good for everybody and stuff that we can actively. And the about. stuff that's good for everyone is sustainable. Mm -hmm. It's like it creates a new environment upon <coughs> which we can build. It's like, to your point around, we can reduce disproportionality by just stopping systemic and that's too, not dealing with anything from a cultural a sustainable standpoint. So that's where the, that base is so important. It allows us to really evolve in a sustainable way. It's sustainable change. Yeah, well, you can stop suspending sorry, yeah, kids for defiance and disrespect, mostly. As it, does it mean that that directly meant we have less defiance and disrespect in our schools? I'd say no. Probably not. Is it still good that we don't suspend them for it and send them home from school? Sure, right? But has that improved the environment, yeah. to answer your question? You know, I think there's, there's a lot of factors behind that. So do you guys have a sense of where we could, obviously money for hiring, but because that's a big one. But although we have a hiring freeze last year, we still hired 40 people. Right. So, so we're always going to hire folks. So um, I was just thinking about your plan that you presented. Yeah. Like there were some resource. Because we talked. <coughs> if we, you know, if we want, you know, I think we always should. We go back to the research and look at what would be the most beneficial from, you know, an economic standpoint grow your own programs um, and looking at alternative, alternative certification. And I was really disappointed, by the way, at DPO earlier this month, if you couldn't tell, when that guy started talking about yeah, licensure. I, I was about ready to start yeah. saying something when you jumped in. I was like, oh, thank God, somebody had to say uh, something. What, 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 Randy Richardson? Yeah. yeah he uh, um, basically 
threw down the whole idea of reciprocity with the argument that we heard from the, the guy at the ISB that, well, we don't want to have all of a sudden this influx of all these subpar teachers coming in. It's a race to the bottom. He kind of gave the fear factor out there, and I just jumped in and said, look, we're committed to diversity, we're committed to <laughs> equity, and we live in a very white state. Right. Right. We are not going to be able to diversify our workforce if we don't look for individuals from outside the state of Iowa. And the more barriers we put up, which the BOEE has done a fantastic job of doing, the harder it's going to be to recruit talent mm -hmm. um, from outside the state. And I, and I kind of left it at, at that, but sorry, we're on, a, we're on a tangent. But I think that goes to it as we talk about this, um, that we're going to have to look at how we recruit differently. And so some of it's in our control and some of it's not. But that's the same with all of these goals, right? Yeah. That, that we can only do the, the parts that we can do. And, um, but there are some things we can do to change the mindset and change the shift about that we believe in developing our own talent, that we believe in recognizing our successful uh, you know, students of color that would want to come back and nurturing that idea of coming back into education over the long run. And so it doesn't, I can't give up my money here. <laughs> it's not dependent on money, but from a sustainable standpoint to do it, to, to start to scale it up, an acceleration too. standpoint, it, it, we do need that. Um, well, is, isn't that the part of the plan <clears throat> that actually costs money? The other parts are not necessarily budget, big budget items. Not necessarily. No. Yeah. Yeah. So well, no. I, 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 I was really happy to hear you make that comment at the oh, DPO thanks. meeting the other, uh, the other day, right? Yeah. I think the, the resource part of the other goals, Charlie, is, is honestly a shift in resources. Is okay. where, and I think that's, no, that's when I talk yeah. about like pushback again from other things. Yeah. Like it might not always be new dollars, but it might be spending our dollars differently, yeah. right? And where, what we decide to commit yeah. to and where some of those resources Well, I'm go. okay with that because we can control that. Getting new dollars is something we really don't have a lot of control. PD is important, right? And that's yeah. that's a cost, whether it's cost neutral because we're doing PD and we just direct what PD there is. I think we've yeah. talked in the past that <coughs> PD is the most successful when people are interested in it. So you can't just mandate you're doing this one and nothing else, right? Because that's not always successful. But you talk about how they're all interrelated, right? You look at Goal 6A of you know creating that shared district and community understanding of what equity and diversity really means, right? Then that helps us create an equitable, inclusive school environment. And when we do that, perhaps we can start retaining uh, teachers and staff of you, color, you right? And then all of those goals help each other yeah. thing, do right? that. So it is with what at the apex. Then. The uh, everyone's attaining their educational goals you know, at, high, at high levels. But to do that in a sustainable way, you have to have the policies, you have to have the culture, you've got the, you have to have the talent, you have to have the stakeholder engagement. I'm not sure what the stakeholder one would be. That would probably be one of the, one of the bottom ones too, but yeah. it, it is almost a, mm -hmm. you could almost Building layer this blocks. in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, and not to, Go for diminish it. Diminish anything Chase just said. But I mean, I think an easy thing we like to point to right away is number four. And I don't think four can be dismissed, right? But it's one thing we can like see the change in, and it yeah. feels like it's easier to affect change in that area, right? The, the, it's just gonna be really difficult. Like Chase said, that I think the most logical solution for a school district that wants to be diverse in Iowa is a grow your own program, right? I mean, using the people here, recruiting people from halfway across the country to come out there it's today at zero degrees. Yeah. You know, we know that's an uphill battle for us, but we do need reciprocity, we do need those things. But I feel like people jump to that as our solution right away because we don't really understand what these other solutions look like. And so that one looks and feels easier to accomplish, even though it's very challenging, right? It's but I think when you... That's actually... Right. Measurable. And that actually doesn't... I'm glad you're saying this, because yeah. I'm not... <clears throat> just by diversifying our staff doesn't mean we accomplish all these no. other things, right? right. And, no. and so... And, and, I know, and I know you're not saying that, but like that... So I'm glad you're but saying this, because... a lot of people in the community are saying that. Right, right. And, and so... I, 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 I think that's... Because that's one thing. They right. don't... I mean, if we asked you know, a lot of people in the public, what, 
doing something about the opportunity gap for structurally disadvantaged students looks like? That's a tough question, right? I mean, that's a tough internal question about how we do that stuff for people that work in education every day. So I think it's one that we just gravitate towards. And so it's one we need to work on. And like Sean said, none of these can be diminished. That's why they're all in the plan as huge mm -hmm. goals. Mm -hmm. But if we're really serious about work we can do, I mean, obviously the policy has to be set here, right? And I think you guys have given us that. Right? That's why you approve the plan, right? That's why we look at these different policies. But I mean, I really think we have to start with that, with that one and three and trying to look critically at our system there about what is that culture, you know, that we're asking our, our students to experience every day and then where have we created, you know, system level issues that we need to try to undo, right? Because the structure is designed to get the results it's getting. Yeah. I mean, and it will yeah. continue to do that until we change the structure yeah. of some of those things. And so I think that's where we have to look at some of those pieces, at least on the academic end. I see number two, disproportionality discipline like Rufina. It's a result of a lot of the other things. It's a symptom yeah. of the problem. So, you know, it's a it's a symptom of all of those other things occurring. So just so <clears throat> trying to reduce those numbers in and of itself is not going to produce. We'd have them fixed by now if that was yeah. as hard as it was. Yeah. You know, if that was the solution, Charlie, we'd have them fixed. turned around. You know, we wouldn't want to keep producing that. It's so much deeper than that. And that's okay. why I say it's, it's the culture and it's those opportunity gaps. I mean, you look, I mean, if you would go and follow a class of kids around or you did that thing where they want you to shadow it and you look at the cohorts of kids, if you don't have music and world language scheduled into your day, I mean, you're gonna be in a very different cohort of students all day long than you are if you have music or language scheduled into your secondary day, right? I mean, if you're in a lower level math track, that's a very different cohort of kids mm -hmm. you're gonna experience a school day with all day. and so. Those are the types of things that then produce discipline numbers by a sense, yeah. right? I mean, they're not engaged maybe in the learning, they're, they're being exposed to maybe things they don't feel very confident about, you know, with a bunch of other people that aren't very confident about what they're doing. And then we see, again, the symptom pop up, which I really is really the core issue. I've been right in the yeah. center of it, and yeah. it, it, that's what it is. It's, yeah. it's, it's two different experiences for our kids, mm -hmm. you know, they're the on a high achieving track, the same building, mm -hmm. and and it results in the, our, in yeah. the outcomes we see. Um, so here, and I know you guys, we're going to do a lot of this big love stuff, but on the, specifically on four, um, you know, I've said this from the board table, but I, you know, doing anything, scaling up, I get, is going to be hard, but could we, is it feasible to ask you to say, here's my perfect model? scaled up, and then here's how we can start piloting. Mm -hmm. and, and what I imagine, to me, the thing that makes the most sense is helping folks. So if we want to do alternative certification, like use what's already there. So whatever the university has already for alternative certification. And then we find a way to pay for it. And I think the forgivable loan Right? I think you give us five years, we will pay 20% off of your loan, and after that five years, you're going to have your teaching certificate and go wherever you want. And if you want to leave before, you're just paying back a loan. It's not like we're demanding $40,000 up front. We're just saying, make your loan payment. And it's probably more affordable for us to pay somebody's loan, you know, to, to do that. Um, specifically targeting um, people in our buildings, currently employees in our so, and specifically paraeducators, or support staff, non-teachers. I mean, I'm imagining to get five of those, one, because our numbers are what they are, we'll move the numbers a little bit with five people. Mm -hmm. And I'm imagining, just from anecdotal stuff I've heard, we have at least five of those where principals are like, I got one, I got one. Mm -hmm. I, right now, I've got one. So if we start that, because I think we, that's what we can show the community you know, here, and, and when we're an equity committee, that's just this last equity committee meeting, one of the women who is a, um, a woman of color who works for the university, a you know, professor, saw the teacher numbers of our percentages of non-white teachers, and she said, well, is that what the district looks like? And it's like, five, five percent. And that was, I mean, she didn't. She just didn't know. She's like, aren't we only 5% non-white? And I was like, no, more like 40. She's like, 
Oh, I mean, it was a, a brand new piece of information, right? Really? Yeah, and I don't know if she, maybe she doesn't have kids in the oh, district. Oh, yeah, I'm like, but. I don't know that she does, I, I don't know. She knew, she knew the area? I, I mean, I don't know. She, yeah, she works in that university so world. Yeah, yeah, right, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it just, just one of the university things, you know. Yeah, I don't well. So your, the short answer is, is yes, okay. and I mean, We've been having some ongoing conversations with the university, and so part of it is trying to work with them about how, what that would look like and how to develop that. And we can continue to have that long term, but if you're looking at us using the Alternative CERT program and going that, yeah, we could start to, to map that out. Because don't they want it too, right? They do, they do, and that's where they're very invested in, in working on it with us. It is funding, but we could look at a pilot. Now, Alternative is, the RAPL is really just secondary right now rather than elementary I think certification but it's a starting point it and that's is. something we could definitely try to try to at least look at a small cohort um, and just get some seed money to get us through you know at least the first year um, 10 so, well we've talked about like if you think about like an FTE sorry Jeff. well that's yeah that's like, absolutely so if you right think about your committing F two FTE to this program or something that's two less you have to put in the system but that's your commitment like you said to the community mm -hmm. to say that's right. Actually, well, now we've yeah. spent those dollars over here because we know eventually those we're investing are those to come back to, to come us. back to so us. Where I was going to go is so we've got a budgeting cycle coming up in front of us. Mm -hmm. We'll be willing to look at what our priorities are for the next academic year. I mean, is this the kind of thing that we want to put on the table? Say, can we allocate some resource for mm -hmm. some pilot program to grow your own or whatever? Oh, I mean, I mean, of course, I'm going to say yes on this. Oh wait, and I oversee but the budget I mean, now, <laughs> so yes. <laughs> so that's the form in which we can have. These yeah. Conversations for resource prioritization for the next academic year. We're right? scaling yeah. up. Well, we know because then we know, hey, it works. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And that gives us a lot more opportunity to. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, if they don't exist now, there's grants for this and that sort of thing. Too. It's just going to find us some partners that are. Yeah. And if you prove you have a workable system, we're more likely to get some yeah. partners. I mean, I, I think it's appropriate to talk about during the budget stuff because that becomes very public. Yeah. And I think if you're going to as you say, allocate FTE to the program, right? We've got to tell people, look, we know class sizes are big because we're short teachers, and they're going to be a little bit big because we're trying to spend some money in this area, right? Because we're going to have to take it. But this is why, right? I mean, that has to be out there very publicly because all we're going to hear is why are class sizes well, yeah. so big? Can't you spend money on teachers? And I'm sorry, I have a building issue I have to go back to work for. So first day sorry. semester problems. Do you need a rise? Isn't that a new building? No, I just text, we did, we opened up a new building, but it's part of my other building that has sensitive research in it. So. Sprinklers yeah. aren't on, are they? Oh. Face is good at that, I heard. Yeah. What? Sprinklers aren't on. Say the sprinklers no, not sprinklers. Public safety. <laughs> Alright. Sorry. Alarms. The chimpanzees are getting out. Get no. no. <laughs> this, this is on tape. I have to answer. Sorry. It's on tape. The university does not have primates anymore. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're going to cover some of these things in budgeting from a priority for things that need resource. I, I really like the idea of looking at the public forums that board members attend and decide of those yep. where we think an admin <coughs> might be a good partner. Um, and that's probably a really easy exercise. And it may be Black Voices Project. It may be some other ones on our list that we just, we just want to partner up. Yep. And I think that's would, a really short-term thing. Would Black Voices be receptive to having a member of administration there? You went for a long time. Your first yeah, in my... Well, I, think, I think they would, yeah. Okay. I, I've had generally some, trying to ask for more representation. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think that's good. Yeah. And actually, that's they, starts... They're, they're not going to draw the back on what you'll role. hear. Yeah, right. exactly. Showing up I thought about that, too, when we talk about five in there, and then it's, you're already connected with yeah. them, and there's a feedback loop established. I, I yeah. think Matt's... You know, what you were saying earlier, is a uh, it would be a helpful thing for member for members of Black Voices to hear, um, and uh, and other groups too. Which, what was that? What? Uh, well, that. Uh, I was talking about the diverse staff the versus diverse staff, the other right, roles. And right, where do we? Right, right. What can we do? And I also think and and <clears throat> and to hear that changing the disproportionality and achievement gaps. <clears throat> can hinge a lot upon the things we've already talked about as well as changing how we're doing math tracking, which uh, 
is not a it's not a subject area you know that we talk about a lot in, uh, in, in black voices. We're gonna, uh, it, it will be disruptive. Yeah. Well, yeah. well yeah, but it won't be disruptive for kids of color. It actually will improve their educational outcome in the long run. Right. But you are gonna be asked. I mean, I, you know, there's gonna be um, so there will not there'll be, be a lot of you know concerned. the biggest thing I think will be around it is fear. Right, I mean, and that's what'll be at the root of it. There'd be a fear that the you know my students gonna right both sides. I think yeah. you know for different reasons, but that feeling is gonna be fear. I mean, it could be fear that I'm gonna be in a class I'm not as comfortable with. Am I gonna be able to be successful? I think there's gonna be fear from the other side that maybe my kid's gonna right. you know be slowed down because exactly. now students aren't as ready to yeah. be in there. It, you it's know, going to be a fear very real. Teachers. How will I know that my kid is better than all of the other kids? Because like that's where that like end is coming from. I feel great because my kid's super awesome and has beaten all the other kids in all of their scores. Mm -hmm. cool. Right? Which, when you say it out loud, it sounds terrible. But that is the mindset of somebody with a very high achieving kid. Right? I have high achieving kids and I feel great when my kid comes home with his test scores and they look great. You know? They give you a percentile right there. Right? That's what the score says. Is You're better than... 95% of the people that took this test, right? That's what's getting reported, right? And that's where you're gonna get that pushback, right? That, but how do we know that our kid is super awesome anymore? If they don't have this thing to point yeah. to, right? That I'm in a... So, so I think you're gonna get more pushback from that end than... Uh, yeah. Well, agreed. And I, personally, I don't, you know, I don't mind dealing with that pushback. I. Um, for me, it's about mastery. I mean, if we're just talking about education, I want to know kids understand stuff that we say it's important that they understand at a high level. I, if I had my druthers, algebra two would not be, calculus would not be the top of math. It would be statistics, just because like everybody needs. Oh boy. Right? <laughs> it's what we talked about this last week. You know, I'm nervous. I'm not going to go to the class. That's part that's of the conversation is yeah. they finish right around at algebra two, or is it a more different looking algebra two class that has more statistics because? That's what data would show us now is that, you know, the need for statistics is so much higher than some of those typical algebra two concepts, you know, but the heartbreaking story, you know, and then I'll really be quiet so Janet can end the meeting if she wants to, is a girl that we had this week come see a counselor that wants to be a nurse. She's completed three years of math. Guess what her math, her last math class was for us? Algebra 1B. Algebra 1. Algebra 1. Yeah, which would be 1B depending on how she did the sequence, but did a math skills, intro to algebra, and then algebra class and she's a senior mm -hmm. and so yes did that kid fail no are they going to get a high school diploma yes do they have a ticket to go anywhere no no we have to depend on the university so can we I, I would like to see us include the change in and how we're doing math not yet not yet do you don't want to do no. yet He's got a the, the reason I say not yet is because we have a math team that's meeting about yeah, this and struggling with some on. of these very real things. Because the part I didn't get to is fear is going to be on the teacher end too, right? Because oh, teachers yeah. want to be successful. And so is it going to be easier to teach a continuum with wider kids? No. Not. No one's going to fool you yeah. on that. It still might be the right thing to do, but it's not going to be easier. So we have to identify supports for teachers, supports yeah. for students. When we come to you, I, th I would just like to be a little bit closer to a solution we feel like we could have a larger conversation with because when it comes to you, it becomes public, right? Yeah. And then we need to be ready for that open conversation with everybody about the conversation we've been accounting for in all of those areas and be able to. Can we consider think, it for be ready. <clears throat> to be ready by the uh, next year? The fall next I year. think by this spring, what we have, we'll have some things that we would like to try okay. and that we'd like to even potentially see some movement on from some of our buildings. We're going to give them some aspirational goals that we'd like to, because part of this is we'd like to pilot a few things before we commit to a solution, right? Okay. We'd like to say, hey, you know, building A might be trying this to diverse, or to uh, collapse their math tracks. Building B might be trying this. And we've tried some of those things this year, but we've already approved a program of studies for next year that has the existing math tracks in it. We've already done placement of that. That's the season we're in. I think by the time we get to program of studies time next fall, what we'd like to do by then is present to you a different model cool. that would be implemented the following. That's cool. Okay. That's right. That's, That's good. kind of well, the Well, it has to be done del as deliberately as possible. Yeah. Yes. Otherwise, we're pulling the rug out, and we, kids and teachers will just be mm -hmm. not know what to do. We have never done it. Like and we might start getting questions now since we sit on the table. I say we bring it all back around yeah. to 
um, our district wide goals and visions and our portrait of a student Absolutely. and all that and say, let's stop saying, here's how we're going to get your kids to pass all their proficiency tests to this is how we're going to have your kids prepared for life after school. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's well, a very exactly. different thing. Yeah. Right. Well, that, well, maybe that should be a, maybe a different expression, but uh, those proficiency uh, results are what then the entire nation looks at in it, terms well, of... Well, but uh, I would argue that if we do the other stuff, we'll... Well, well that, that's okay if the, the, number, the, the proficiency numbers should change if we do the other stuff. Yeah. Right now, they don't have a chance of changing. Yeah. The stuff we're assessing most of our 11th graders on, some of our 11th graders have never seen. Never, and never right? will see. Yeah. And never would see. And so they don't have a chance of passing. How about third grade? Yeah. But I think that... Well, that third grade is the onset of the problem, right? That's where we start to identify where we have a gap. Yeah. Matt's yeah. taking all the time for me to make my final oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. So, no. you, you so, the last Thank you. I, 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 I appreciate that. I, well, no, I know you are. And that's what I actually was going to comment on. And whether it's around portrait of a graduate, which I think is great, or... Is that what we're calling yeah. portrait of a graduate? Yeah. Yes. Or the work around equity or that. I think tonight's conversation has been really energizing and as importantly, it's been rather positive. Like we've talked about some things where we need to make changes and we need to focus on where we're not doing what we need to do. But overall, we've stayed very positive in how we're gonna do that work. And I think in everything we do, we need to find a way to change the tenor of the conversation oh, yeah. because high achieving school districts focus on their successes and then build on those. And so often we get drugged down into the negative side of it. And so I don't know how we do that, but the more we can talk about our successes in the equity plan and how we're gonna remedy some of the things that aren't going the way we want to by building on those, I think the, the better we are. And that's a, like that's deep, deep, like second level, huge change. But it, it's exciting to have conversations like this because it makes me think we can change this narrative and not ignore the things that we need to improve, but really champion why people want to come to go to school here. Right. You know, and that, that, why that's they want what, to come here and teach. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Why want to be on the school board? Yes. Why don't want to be administrators in the district, right? Nobody understands that. <laughs> that's a good point, Steve. So I want to be clear on action items um, that way. We'll take a look at all the. I'm looking. I don't know. I'm looking at each page. That's fine. Because I have the. I mean, maybe, actually, maybe maybe Sean and I can sit with Steve and look at the list of all the committee assignments and public <coughs> meetings next time we do agenda setting and see how we can yep. get some mm -hmm. additional um, admin team to support those meetings. I don't think it's a lot. I don't think it is either. No. Maybe. And so we'll so we'll take that action item and get with Steve on that next time we do well, agenda setting. I sit on that one. And then, um, and then we'll make sure as we're doing our budgeting process that we focus where we think we need to put some resource to move some of the equity agenda items forward. I mean, I'm not sure anything else tactically coming from this conversation tonight other than also the uh, commitment to communicate both ways. You know, we'll pick up the phone and ask questions. Um, if you're feeling like there's something we need to be aware of, we don't trust you to you know, send us a note and say, call us if you have more questions. Um, I just, I think it goes both ways. I really like the way you said that, Sean. I mean, it, we just can't see your demand being given all the information. We've got to be thoughtful about where we're going, what information we need, and we need to be ready to ask for it. And we could come back with the only other tactic we thought about was that goal three instead of goal one, if you wanted to see that first. Or we could even yeah. try that. Yeah. I mean, I we've been working on the kind of the goal one to break that out. Layering but, yeah. That so maybe we'll turn our attention to goal three first. Yeah. And then, not that, like I said, we're ending any of the work in any of the areas, but as far as how we're going to present it. Um, yeah, and some point yeah. we'll have a pilot for our program. Like, right. Oh, don't trust me. I, we will, we, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have that ready to go. Like, I'll dust that off. Five oh, we can do that. Yeah. So can you maybe communicate with uh, uh, Paul and uh, Lisa about this meeting? Yeah, I'll Thank send you, you. listen to the tape. Okay. <laughs> that's that's the terrible. Link. That's but, a great way. But I mean, you want to hear the conversation. Yeah, um, yeah for anybody who is <laughs> listening to this, uh, I can give the rewind all the way back tactical. and okay. find a copy of our CDEEP, as uh, <laughs> JP CD. likes to call it, right. uh, our plan. So when we just say number one and number four and number three, you know what the heck we're talking about. Because yeah, I'm recording, it's probably not going to come through very well. Sorry. Very well. <laughs> Okay, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. All in favor? Aye. All in favor? Aye. All in favor? Aye.
Labor. Aye. Labor. Aye. Aye.